Hello, I am Masahiro Sakurai from Sora Limited. Today, I'd like to introduce you to a new video from BDZB Comics. As you may know, BDZB Comics is a YouTube channel about Super Smash Bros. movesets, Steven Universe content, and whatever other geeky thing Ben feels like talking about that day. Many characters have appeared on this channel, so before we get into the main topic here, let's take a look back at some of the characters featured over the past 14 years. I've prepared a video to showcase these characters. The text below each name signifies the first BDZB Comics video that they appeared in. Please take a look. Hey world, welcome to my universe. here, and holy freaking crap, Lois! Was that Masahiro Sakurai? I can't believe he'd want to introduce one of my videos. Uh, but if there were any video that warranted this, it would be this one. Because today we'll be looking back on one of my favorite book series from my childhood, Captain Underpants! Underpants! Growing up, my family and I were big fans of Dave Pilkey, particularly his Dumb Bunnies series. While the general concept of series where everyone is an idiot is pretty sophomoric and wasn't exactly a new idea even back then, the Dumb Bunnies books were chock full of wit, 
charm and great visual gags that really won my parents over and got them just excited to read to me as I was to hear goofy stories from them. Then, once I got a little bit older, I started to notice the cool older kids walking around with their Captain Underpants books. These books call themselves epic novels and were divided into chapters. They seemed a little too grown up for little old me. But I remember one of the cool older kids in Sunday school showed my mom the book and she read out what was on the cover. The Adventures of Captain Underpants, the first epic novel by Dave Pilkey. My child brain went like, wait, that Dave Pilkey? No way, it has to be a different Dave Pilkey. And mom was like, Nah, fam, this gotta be the same dude, my dude. And at that point, my fate was sealed. I had to read these books. And eventually, I did. I read every single one of them. Though there was a bit of a gap where I kind of fell off before picking the series back up. But hey, I know a lot of people have been using their quarantine to reconnect with pieces of media from their childhood. So, last fall, that's what I did with old CU. And speaking of, I will see you in the next segment. Bill, Bill, Bill. Part 1. The Classical Clinton Era. T minus 7 seconds. There are 12 books in the Captain Underpants series, spanning the course of almost 20 years. So, with a series this large, I think it makes sense to split it up into thirds. The first four books in the Captain Underpants series are as follows. The Adventures of Captain Underpants. Captain Underpants and the Attack of the Talking Toilets. Captain Underpants and the Invasion of the Incredibly Naughty Cafeteria Ladies from Outer Space and the Subsequent Assault of the Equally Evil Lunchroom Zombie Nerds and Captain Underpants and the Perilous Plot of Professor Poopy Pants. These books released between 1997 and 2000, and had already been out for quite some time by the time I started getting into the series. They serve as sort of an origin story for our waistband warrior. A lot of running gags of the series are established in the first four books, and notably, the Captain Underpants movie primarily pulls from these four books as well. Ideally, if we were to ever get a sequel to that movie, I would pull from the next four books, and then if it became a trilogy, I would pull from the next four books after that. Have a simple, you know, four books a movie thingamapoop. But, you know, I'm just gonna have to cross my fingers for that. The Adventures of Captain Underpants is the shortest and most grounded entry in the Captain Underpants series. Seriously, this epic novel is only... Alright, well, it doesn't show a page number. You have to believe me here. <laughs> it's only 120 pages long. Uh, and some of the pages only have a single sentence on them. Like... Here. Yeah, see? See that? Single sentence right there. I can't tell where I'm pointing, but you, got, you gotta believe me. Yeah, okay. Single sentence right here. But you know what they say? It's not about the length. It's about how you use it. And so, how does Dave Pilkey do with his first entry? Well, he does well! Uh, the Adventures of Captain Underpants lays the foundation for future stories to subvert, lampshade, and build upon. To show you what I mean, let's read the first chapter together, shall we? Meet George Beard and Harold Hutchins. George is the kid on the left with the tie and the flat top. Harold is the one on the right with the t-shirt and the bad haircut. Remember that now. George and Harold were best friends. They had a lot in common. They lived right next door to each other, and they were both in the same fourth grade class at Jerome Horwitz Elementary School. George and Harold were usually responsible kids. Whenever anything bad happened, George and Harold were usually responsible. But don't get the wrong idea about these two. 
George and Harold were actually very nice boys. No matter what everybody else thought, they were good, sweet, and lovable. Well, okay, maybe they weren't so sweet and lovable, but they were good nonetheless. It's just that George and Harold each had a silly streak a mile long. Usually, that silly streak was hard to control. Sometimes, it got them into trouble. And once, it got them into big, big trouble. <laughs> but before I can tell you that story, I need to tell you this story. So, right off the bat, this chapter does a few things. First of all, it introduces us to our main characters. That's right, despite the series being called Captain Underpants, these boys are the real stars of the series, and they're the ones that we're going to see grow and develop throughout. Right now, they're juvenile little scamps, and we can see that through the establishment of one of the series' many running gags, where the pair rearranges the letters on a flower shop sign to say, Pick our noses. Speaking of running gags, this opening chapter is almost identical throughout the series. Every single opening chapter to a Captain Underpants book introduces us to the main characters, explains what's going on in their lives at that moment, and asks us to remember that now. And then leads into the next chapter with, Before I can tell you that story, I need to tell you this story. It's formulaic by design. And like with an episode of, say, Phineas and Ferb, the fun of each book comes from seeing how they iterate on that formula each time. Anyway, on to the next few chapters. In chapter two, we learn that George and Harold are young entrepreneurs who work in their treehouse, producing comics to sell on the playground. One cool detail in this chapter is that they go over all the different superheroes they've created over the years, and among them is Dogman. If that name sounds familiar to you, there's a good reason. Dogman is the latest book series from Dave Pilkey, with its newest entry, Mothering Heights, coming out just earlier this year. We can get into the Dogman series and how it ties into the Pilkey Extended Universe later, but let's focus back on George and Harold for now. The next chapter shows them on the playground, selling comic books about their favorite original character, do not steal, Captain Underpants. Through the comic, we learn that the fictionalized version of CU is faster than a speeding waistband, more powerful than boxer shorts, and able to leap tall buildings without getting wedgy. So, yeah. Pretty much the most powerful superhero in the world. We also learn a little bit more about George and Harold through their comics. They aren't exactly great at drawing or spelling, but they got spirit, dang it. Well, spirit and a serious disdain for gym teachers, which honestly is one of my favorite running gags throughout the series. Their comic is a big hit across the playground, and kids wait with much anticipation for the Attack of the Talking Toilet sequel teased at the end. However, while George and Harold are preoccupied with selling their comic books, an evil presence looms before them. Their school principal, Mr. Krupp, who I guess you could say this this outfit is like partially based on. Um, I was I was going for like a a, a George inspired outfit, but. You know, Krupp works too. I, I can't pull off uh, Harold's hair here, and I'm not going to be um, doing this video in my underpants, so I figure if I'm going to dress up as one of the characters, it should be George. Uh, but, you know, uh, Mr. Mr. Krupp, Mr. Krupp here, similar getup. You know, you know, see him here, similar getup. Anyway, <laughs> see, Krupp didn't become an elementary school principal due to his love of children. He did it out of his disdain. For children. In fact, all of the teachers at Jerome Horace Elementary School feel that way. They teach only because they want to be able to punish and humiliate kids. I'm gonna get those boys one day, Mr. Krupp vowed. One day, very, very soon. Now, I want to pause for just a moment to go over how this story thus far relates to the author's life. Dave Pilkey has made it no secret 
the characters of George and Harold are largely based off of himself, as he too loved to draw comics and pull pranks as a kid. He had a hard time focusing in class due to ADHD, but what's true now, and was especially true back then when he was in school, was that the teachers didn't really know how to handle kids with ADHD and ended up punishing Dave and making him feel bad more than helping him. I doubt that any of his IRL teachers were as actively malicious as Mr. Krupp, but they clearly were in over their heads and didn't know how to meet their students' needs. As a kid, it's easy to write off teachers as just plain mean which I think is part of what makes the Captain Underpants series so relatable to children. Really, though, it's a systemic issue with how schools are set up and how educators are themselves educated. Believe it or not, Pilkey eventually acknowledged the systemic nature of this in later CU books, but we'll get to that much later. Anyway, what did George and Harold do to land themselves in trouble this time? Well, they really tampered with the school's football game, putting pepper in the cheerleaders' pom-poms, pouring bubble bath into the marching band's instruments, and so much more. Krupp caught this all on video and basically used it as an excuse to turn George and Harold into his personal slaves, having them wash his car, trim his nails, etc. Desperate for a way out of this situation, the duo ordered a toy advertised in the back of one of the comic books. A 3D hypno ring. Those things never work in real life, and this is a pretty grounded story so far, so I bet that it's not gonna work out for- uh, uh, Oh, uh, uh, okay, uh, George and Harold are now controlling Mr. Krupp. First, George and Harold used the hypno ring to replace the video evidence of them pranking the football team and take all of their confiscated stuff back from Mr. Krupp. Once their mission is complete, they figure they can have a little fun with it and make Mr. Krupp act silly for them. During this time, they come up with the not-so-bright idea to convince Krupp that he is Captain Underpants, and so he strips down to his skivvies ties a conveniently placed red curtain with black dots on it around his neck, and then runs outside ready to fight crime. Worried about what he'll do, George and Harold chase after them. At first, CU's attempts to stop criminals blow up in his face. He gets laughed at by some robbers, and then nearly gets arrested himself before George and Harold come to his rescue, at which point something rather interesting happens. The trio encounter two robots stealing a diamond from a nearby building. And I think George sums it up pretty nicely. You know, up until now, this story was almost believable. They follow the robots into an old abandoned warehouse, where they meet the first of many iconic villains for the series. Dr. Diaper. With his Lasermatic 2000, he plans to take aim at the moon, but... Before he's able to fire, George and Harold trick him into thinking he pooped himself with a well-aimed slingshot and some fake doggy do. What I love about Dr. Diaper is that it's never explained why he's wearing nothing but a diaper. Believe it or not, most of the future CU villains have legitimate reasons for their sophomoric designs, but Dr. Diaper... He inherited the last name Diaper and I guess just decided to commit to the bit, I guess? The world may never know. Anyway, with Dr. Diaper distracted, the robots decide to take matters into their own robotic claws. Is this children's book really gonna show a pair of fourth graders getting killed by robots? Of course not. That would be way too violent. Instead, they show the exact opposite through the latest and greatest in cheesy animation technology, Flip Oh, Rama! These flipbook-like sections are a staple of Captain Underpants books. Each book has at least one chapter dedicated to these, and any Captain Underpants media without some sort of reference to flip rama just feels incomplete in my book. That's why I was super jazzed when both the CU movie and the Netflix series included flip rama segments. The Netflix show even went an extra mile 
to come up with a different spin-off of the Flipporama formula every single episode. Speaking of, if you ever want to see me make a video on the CU movie, TV show, or both, leave a comment telling me as much, and you just might see those videos pop up in the future. Anyway, to make a long story short, which coincidentally is the name of at least one chapter in every single Captain Underpants book, George, Harold, and Captain Underpants defeat the robots, get Dr. Diaper arrested, and turn CU back into Mr. Krupp, which they're able to do by pouring water on his head. Now that Krupp's back to normal, he proceeds with his plan to show the football team the surveillance video he took, but instead of showing George and Harold prepping their pranks, they instead see a Barney-like children's show. They apparently really liked what they saw, too, because from this point on, the knuckleheads are no more. They are instead the Jerome Horwitz Purple Dragon sing-along friends. It seems like all's well that ends well for our heroes, except for one tiny little thing now. Whenever somebody snaps their fingers around Mr. Krupp, he turns back into Captain Underpants. So that's book one, the shortest entry in the series and the one that's most grounded in reality. Both this and the next book feature a set of heroes without any real superpowers to speak of. So I think it's interesting to see how the trio use a combination of quick wits and tools to take down the baddies. Also of note is that Krupp is able to replicate Captain Underpants' briefs shooting technique, even without any powers. Not only is that impressive in its own right, but it, along with how in-character Krupp is the whole time he's CU, implies that he actually reads George and Harold's comic books and enjoys them to an, the extent that he has internalized the Captain Underpants character. Maybe this hints at more depth for old Kruppy than just mean principal guy. Perhaps there was an air of jealousy to the Krupp character, upset at his students' talents, wanting to suppress them? Well, when it comes to jealousy... There's really no better embodiment of that than a character that we'll see for the first time in our next story. Captain Underpants and the Attack of the Talking Toilets. This book starts off with what will become a staple of Captain Underpants books going forward. A short recap of the tale so far told via one of George and Harold's comic books. We have our obligatory George and Harold chapter before proceeding into the main plot which involves an invention convention at the school. The winner of a convention gets to be principal for a day, which can't be legal, right? Like, you can't just have a fourth grader running a school for a day. That's child labor. But uh, whatever, it's definitely not the least believable thing in this story. George and Harold are excited to participate, but Mr. Krupp dashes their hopes by informing them that they are barred from competing in the convention due to a prank they pulled the year prior. Upset that they can't directly participate, the duo decide to tamper with the other participants' inventions instead. While doing this, they run into the school brainiac, Melvin Sneedley, working on a device called the photo -otom Okay, you're going to have to bear with me here. The name of the device that Melvin Sneedley is working on is called the photoatomic transombogulating yectofantriputonic zanziptomizer 2000, or Patsy 2000 for short. This device can bring images to life, which he demonstrates by effectively 3D printing a mouse. George and Harold, recognizing that this has no basis in real-world science, think that Melvin is playing some sort of trick and just assumes that it's a regular photocopier that he spruced up and proceed to prep their pranks. The next day at the convention, the audience gets covered in ink, eggs, and butterscotch pudding launched by a dog washer, ping pong server, and volcano detector, respectively. Hey, how could this have happened? cried Mr. Krupp. Um, excuse me, Mr. Krupp, said Melvin. I think I have the answer to your question. As punishment... Krupp forces George and Harold into detention for the rest of the school year. Trying to make the best of the situation, the duo writes another comic book, Captain Underpants and the Attack of the Talking Toilets. Hey, that's the name of this book! 
They only have one copy, though, so they sneak out of the detention hall in order to make more. With the office full of teachers, their next best option is to use the Patsy 2000. And I think at this point you know where this story is going. Talking toilets begin chasing after the boys, chanting, Yum, yum, eat em up! Running away in terror, the boys bump into Mr. Krupp, who suspends them on the grounds that they shouldn't have left the detention hall. All of the school's teachers are about ready to throw a party to celebrate their suspension when the gym teacher gets swallowed by a talking toilet. Upset, George and Harold's homeroom teacher snaps her fingers, at which point Mr. Krupp's transformation into Captain Underpants is triggered. Having stolen some underwear from a nearby clothesline, CU tries to shoot the extra briefs directly at the toilets, but they end up just eating them and taking no damage. That's when George and Harold get the bright idea to fill the undies with cafeteria food to make the toilets throw up all the teachers. Their plan works, but before they can celebrate their victory, a giant toilet known as the Turbo Toilet 2000 comes stomping in. Captain Underpants tries to fight him, but is promptly defeated and swallowed inside. With the Cape Crusader defeated, and no more cafeteria food to toss, George and Harold are forced to return to the Patsy 2000 to stop the tyrannical toilet. Using the device, they bring to life the Incredible Robo Plunger, a giant plunger-wielding robot. Robo Plunger proceeds to beat the ever-loving tar out of Turbo Toilet, who spits out Captain Underpants, who unfortunately got wet inside the bowl and turned back into Mr. Krupp. With the school in disarray, Krupp panics, but George and Harold offer to have Robo Plunger clean everything up and convince all the teachers that the talking toilets were just a weird dream, on the condition that they get to be principals for a day. Krupp agrees. Robo Plunger flies all the toilets to Uranus, and we get my favorite chapter title in this book. Chapter 4, Principals for a Day, or The Invention Convention Detention Suspension Prevention. George and Harold end up hosting an absolute banger of a party with free food and a live DJ. While all of the teachers are stuck in the detention hall writing sentences on the chalkboard. While this might seem like a huge expense for a public school, the book actually offers an explanation for this. George and Harold sold Mr. Krupp's desk as well as all of the furniture in the teacher's lounge. Naturally, this makes Mr. Krupp quite angry but before he can retaliate, a fellow faculty member snaps her fingers, turning Krupp back into Captain Underpants. Of the books in the classical Clinton era, this is probably my least favorite. But that's not to say it's outright bad or unimportant to the series. This book introduces quite a few recurring characters and sets up some events for much later in the series. One thing that's interesting about these first two books is that they both come with cheeky little messages in the front. The first comes with the Sturgeon's general warning, stating that the book may be offensive to those who don't wear underwear. And given how frequently Captain Underpants books get banned by public schools and libraries, I think they might be right about that. The second book states that it's endorsed by PETT, or People for the Ethical Treatment of Toilets. But given that the conflict is resolved by a giant robot beating up a toilet, I'm not exactly sure that the organization would love this title. Anyway, on to book number three, where the impact on future Captain Underpants titles is far more immediately apparent. Captain Underpants and the Invasion of the Incredibly Naughty Cafeteria Ladies from Outer Space and Subsequent Assault of the Equally Evil Lunchroom Zombie Nerds. This book starts out the same way as the last, with a comic recapping the events of the series thus far, but this time it's vaguely Star Wars themed, so that's kind of neat. Anyway, our story proper begins when a UFO lands on top of Jerome Horwitz Elementary School. Inside, we see three aliens. Zorks, Clax, and Jennifer. Their mission? Take over Earth! The kids and teachers inside the school pay no attention to this. To them, it's just a normal school day. George and Harold are sitting in science class, making dog and cat noises to confuse 
their poor idiot teacher, Mr. Fide. While Fide might not have the common sense to tell the difference between real animals and fourth graders making animal sounds, he's at least smart enough to demonstrate how baking soda and vinegar react to each other using a paper mache volcano, which gives George and Harold the bright idea to send a recipe with those ingredients to the school lunch ladies, claiming that it's a cupcake recipe for Mr. Krupp's birthday. The next two? Chapters? Uh, hold on. What? Yeah. So, okay. L let me, let me, let me just explain this really quick. Um, so, chapter six. What happens next? Chapter six and a half. Here comes the goo. I don't, I don't know what to classify these as, but the next one and a half chapters are some of my favorite in the series so far because of just how much fun they have with such a simple concept. Chapter 6 begs readers to shake their book back and forth uncontrollably and yell, KABLOOSH! in as loud of a voice as they can. Then, Chapter 6.5 shows the cake batter getting absolutely everywhere. It even breaks the fourth wall by having it cover half the text on the next page. The next day, the lunch ladies have a meeting in Mr. Krupp's office, seeking revenge for George and Harold's pranks, and the mean comic book that they wrote about them, which expands the Captain Underpants floor by giving him a utility waistband, which he uses to summon a roll of toilet paper to be swung upon. Weirdly, Mr. Krupp doesn't jump at the opportunity to punish George and Harold here, thinking that the lunch ladies need to provide more proof before he doled out punishment. Perhaps his hypnotized adventures as Captain Underpants have subconsciously influenced him to go easier on the boys. After all, IRL hypnotism doesn't work unless the person being hypnotized is willing to do the thing that you wanted them to do in the first place. So, on some level, Krupp probably wanted to help George and Harold earlier. Psychoanalysis aside, though, the lunch ladies don't like that Krupp won't punish the boys and decide to up and quit on him. Knowing how tough it is to get new lunch ladies on such short notice, the aliens disguise themselves as Zorkset, Klaxet, and Jenniferet, ready to apply for the job. And man, I have always loved this exchange. Wow, said Mr. Krupp. Do you have any experience? Now, said Klaxet, do you have any credentials? No, said Zorkset. Uh, do you have any references? No, said Jenniferette. Wow, you're hired! With that out of the way, Krupp comes up with a plan to keep an eye on George and Harold and make sure they can't tamper with any more cafeteria food. He bans them from the cafeteria and makes them bring brown bags into his office to eat his, their lunches there instead. No more cafeteria food, whispered Harold. I thought he said he was going to punish us. Yeah, George replied. Maybe if we're real bad, he'll take away our homework privileges, too. The duo make the best of the situation, and honestly ends up being more of a punishment for Krupp as he learns about the debauched lunches that they make when left to their own devices. Stuff like tuna salad sandwiches with chocolate chips and mini marshmallows. When Krupp is sufficiently grossed out, he leaves the office for fresh air, and George and Harold follow suit. When they emerge, they notice that the lunch menu sign doesn't need any of its letters rearranged. It's already weird and gross. Plus, kids are exiting the cafeteria as zombified nerds! George and Harold sneak into the cafeteria, where they learn of the alien's plan to zombify the youth, and then make them grow huge using super evil rapid growth juice. They're able to foil part two of the plan by pouring the rapid growth juice out of the window where it lands on a dandelion. But they still have to figure out how to reverse the effects of the zombie juice. They go to Mr. Krupp for advice, but he doesn't believe them right away. So they bring in the zombified secretary, Miss Anthrope, for proof. See, said Harold, She's dressed like a nerd! She always dresses like that, snapped Mr. Krupp. But she's gray and clammy, and reeks of freakish zombified death, cried George. 
She always smells like that, and she's always gray and clammy, too. George and Harold soon realized that maybe the school secretary wasn't the best person to bring in to prove their point, but when she takes a bite out of Krupp's presumably brand new desk, given the events of the last book, he has to admit that she's acting weirder than usual. He heads into the kitchen with them to confront the cafeteria ladies, but when Zork snaps her lack of fingers at Krupp, he transforms into Captain Underpants and runs straight out the door, leading George and Harold to have to defend themselves. This leads to yet another flip o rama chapter, and I gotta say, the intro to this particular chapter is maybe the best one in the series. It warns readers that if they're sensitive to graphic violence, they should run to the nearest shoe store and ask them to make you a cheeseburger. Apparently, Captain Underpants is sensitive to violence himself, as when pressed about why he wasn't fighting the aliens, he offers the cheeseburger shoe store explanation. Fortunately, George and Harold didn't really need Captain Underpants' help beating up the aliens, but it's still good that he came back when he did, because that's when the zombie nerds begin their assault. Unsure where else to go, they head to the roof of the school. Well, we're safe now, said Harold. Yep, said George. That's for sure, said Captain Underpants. In actuality, there was a giant evil dandelion monster behind them, and the aliens were coming up from underneath. With nowhere else to go, they climbed aboard the alien's ship and discovered a bunch of strange juices that they had in the fridge on board, including extra strength superpower juice. I think you can see where this is going. After a daring escape, Captain Underpants lands within the mouth of the evil dandelion. With no other way of fighting back, George is forced to pour the superpower juice in the Cap's mouth, leading to another Flipporama chapter showing off the Captain's newfound super strength and flight abilities. With the dandelion defeated and a bottle of anti-evil zombie nerd juice found, George and Harold are able to coax their classmates into drinking the juice and their principal into getting back into normal clothes. It would be easy to say that the status quo has been restored, but that's not quite the case here, because from then on, whenever somebody snapped their fingers around Mr. Krupp, he would not simply run out the door. He would fly as the newly superpowered waistband warrior, Captain Underpants. I remember this book being my favorite of the four as a kid, and I can definitely see why. The aliens make for fun villains, it's cool to see the title character finally get his powers, and I especially like how the end of the book promises something fun in the mail for all the kids who got in trouble for yelling KABLOOSH! Still, the story is full of contrivances, such as how nearly every problem and solution in the story is created by drinking a specific type of juice. In a less self-aware series, this would really bug me, but here they seem to know that it's contrived, so I can just do a little eye roll and then move on. And I would move on to... Captain Underpants and the Perilous Plot of Professor Poopy Pants. This book, like all the others, starts off with a comic book recap and the obligatory George and Harold chapter, but its second chapter actually takes place away from the town of Pickler for a bit, introducing us to the country of New Switzerland, where everybody has a goofy name. Chief among them is Professor Pippi P. Poopy Pants, a brilliant scientist working to eliminate waste and end world hunger with his latest inventions, the Shrinky Pig 2000 and Goosey Grow 4000, respectively. He plans on showing these inventions off to scientists and academics around the world, but everywhere he goes, he gets laughed at for his ridiculous name. Poor guy, I hope things turn around for him. Anyway, back in Ohio, George and Harold are prepping for a party at the Piqua Pizza Palace when Mr. Krupp notices them changing the letters on a nearby sign. He decides to ban them from going on the field trip to prevent them from causing any mischief there, making them stay behind to do chores instead. This is actually a pretty relatable story for me, who, as an 8th grader, cut a kid's hair in my Spanish class without permission. 
Not only did I miss the end of the year trip to Champions Fun Center and stay in detention, but my mom told me that what I did could qualify as assault in court. Like, I'm sure that's technically true, but like, come on, that seems a little bit overdramatic. Anyway, while I was being lectured, the kids who told me that I should cut that guy's hair were parting it up at the arcade. So, you know, fair's fair. While I tried to stay on my best behavior while I was in detention, George and Harold did not. They set up an elaborate trap that would pelt their teachers with water, powdered paste, and styrofoam pellets so that when they got back, they'd end up running through the halls looking like abominable snowmen. Mr. Fide, who you might remember as the science teacher from the last book, ended up getting out of the bus a little later than the other teachers and therefore didn't get pelted with packing peanuts. He merely witnessed the styrofoam-covered school teachers running down the halls and assumed that they were actually yetis. This became the straw that broke the camel's back for Mr. Fide, as the next day he told Mr. Krupp that he needed to resign as a teacher for his own sanity. I think I'm cracking up. It all started a few months ago when I had this dream that I got eaten by a talking toilet. And then I started hearing dogs and cats meowing and growling in my classroom. Then, I imagine that the school got flooded with sticky green goop, and just yesterday, I saw a group of abominable snowmen chasing two boys down the hallway. Now, wait a minute, Morty, said Mr. Krupp. All that can be explained. And a few days ago, I saw a big fat guy in his underwear fly out the window. Holy cow, you are crazy! And with that, Mr. Fide was let go. A couple of notes before I move on, though. First of all, before rereading this series for this project, I had forgotten about Mr. Fide's existence, but I really like him as a character. I think the concept of a dim-witted but well-meaning science teacher works as a nice counterbalance to most of the teachers being just plain evil. And I do legitimately feel bad for the guy, as, lacking the context behind the last three books, I'd think I was going crazy as well. I also love the dude's name and the clever pun work therein. Mr. Fide sounds like mystified, but now that we know that his first name is Morty, it also works as a pun for mortified, and both of those words really fit his character. Basically, all of the teachers in the series are named like this. Why, in this book alone, we have misdirected, mislabeler, misribble, and misdemeanor. The only one who doesn't really fit is Mr. Krupp. What kind of pun were they going for there? Mr. Krupp? Mr. Rupt? Mr. Our Krupp? I don't really get it. At least not yet. Uh, maybe learning his first name will clear things up a bit. Meanwhile, Poopy Pants reads in the newspaper that Jerome Horwitz Elementary is looking for a new science teacher and realizes that this is the perfect opportunity for him. Also in that newspaper, we see a continuity nod to book two, as well as an article about how reading small print is bad for your eyes. All these articles are quite funny, but you may need a magnifying glass to read them. Poopy Pants shows up at school and predictably gets laughed at by the children. That is, until he shows off one of his inventions the Gerbil Jogger 2000, which is basically a gerbil-sized mech suit. During a demonstration of this invention, George asks for his middle name, which he reveals to be Pee Pee. This, of course, causes the class to burst into laughter once again. It also inspires George and Harold to write a comic book about the professor, which, when he discovers it, sends him into a fit of rage. Sick and tired of being mocked, Professor Poopy Pants uses the Goosey Grow to enhance and enlarge the gerbil jogger to a human size. He also uses the Shrinky Pig to shrink the school down to the size of a dollhouse. Finally, he grows a pencil until it's large enough to write on billboards, filling three blank ones entirely. He calls this setup the Name Changeo Chart 2000. 
which uses the first letter of your current first name, as well as both the first and the last letter of your last name to determine your new legally mandated silly name on par with the citizens of New Swissland. My friends and I used to go around the room determining everyone's silly name. I'm Lumpy Toilet Chunks, which is quite the visceral image. I must say, though, I'm not alone in that Lumpy name, because as it turns out, Mr. Krupp's first name is also Benjamin. Although, he does go by Benny. So... Now, working out what pun his name is based on, it would be... Bonnie Krupp? Ben Y. Corrupt? Oh, hold on one second. short on cash. I mean, maybe he is now that he had to buy his desk back, but like, nothing else in the text really seems to point to that. Is he morally bankrupt? I guess you could argue that, but man, why did they pick the worst pun for the most important teacher character in the series? I guess just because Krupp sounds kind of mean? I'm putting too much thought into this. The next chapter is sort of a reprise of the first, reintroducing George and Harold as Fluffy and Cheeseball, respectively. It also attempts to introduce Captain Underpants as Buttercup Chicken Fanny, but he denounces that title as he grabs the Goosey Grove from Poopy Pants. Unfortunately, while grabbing the invention, he gets zapped by the Shrinky Pig, causing him to seemingly disappear. Still, Fluffy and Cheeseball are men with a plan. And that plan is to get on top of the school and grow it back to its usual size. Unfortunately, Poopy Pants catches wind of this plan and ends up shaking them off the roof. This leads to a sequence wherein our dynamic duo fly through the town on a paper airplane, narrowly avoiding a wood chipper, dachshund, and steamroller thingy. They soon realize that it isn't dumb luck that keeps saving them but rather a microscopic yet still super strong Captain Underpants. Once they're able to pinpoint the captain's location, they grow him to the size of Poopy Pants so that he can take him out and save the world. A Flipporama chapter shows the downfall of Professor Pippy P. Poopy Pants, who is shrunk down to normal size shortly thereafter. As he is being escorted by the police, George gives him some advice. Wouldn't it be smarter to change your own name instead of forcing the rest of the world to change theirs? Pippi takes this advice as he writes George and Harold from prison, announcing his new name. Tippy Tinkle Trousers. And that's it! That's the last book! In the classic Clinton era, anyway. We've still got eight more books to go, but I'll save those for future videos. Before I close things out, though, I did want to give some thoughts on this book and the classic series as a whole. And that is to say that both are fun, but not particularly deep. These early books don't have nearly as much social commentary, nor rely as heavily on continuity as the later books in the series, but they lay the groundwork for those books to do bigger and better things. The fourth book in particular introduces Pippi, or I guess Tippy now, who will later become an important villain in both the books and Captain Underpants, the first epic movie. I said at the beginning, but I can't really overstate how great the running gags in this series are. There are some really great ones that I forgot about before rereading this series, like this mom and her son who are always hanging out together during some of the weirder events of each book. Every time the boy tells his mom what's going on, she dismisses it as ridiculous. Meanwhile, she's reading about something ridiculous herself and buying it hook, line, and sinker. This gag is funny in its own right, but it also establishes what will eventually become an overarching theme for the series. That adults think that they know better than their children when really anyone could be dumb or naive regardless of age. And stifling the creativity of others, especially children, isn't going to help anybody in the long run. 
you'll see this theme and several others pop up next time when we cover the next four books in the Captain Underpants series, which I call the Booger Bush era. See you then! Go Pooping Pants! 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 What? Um... Who put that interesting background there? Uh, wait. Okay, so my bed is here. I am not sitting on it to record. Did did I get transported to another dimension? Is this is this where all of my videos are going to take place from now on? That's pretty freaking sweet, bro.